Okay. I don't want to miss the magic <laughs> the gems. right before our <laughs> eyes just because I didn't think we were ready. But I think we're ready. Okay. Cool, Antonio. So we're back from the Dom, right? No injuries, no uh, nothing funky going on. No, no, only only uh, injuries to my pride. <laughs> it's your pride, there. Actually, doctor not. for that. <laughs> but actually, not. No, man. It's it's my it's my boyhood dream. You know, since I was a little kid, you know, go to Mongolia, wrestle in Nana. I mean, it's been a thing that I've dreamed about. And uh, for a lot of people, you don't know how many people, when I tell them I live in Mongolia, they go, oh, have you ever seen Nadam? Like to them, it's like, yeah, that's their dream, you know, to go see Nadam, you know? And I'm like, now I can be like, I wrestled in Nadam badly. (laughs) (laughs) Phil, that's pretty cool. I'm sure not, I'm sure, I'm sure they didn't win their first Nadam either. Uh, No, they all did actually. Everyone, everyone did. When you're, when you're down, everybody's much better than you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure they've lost some matches, too. Sure. But other wrestlers, no. yeah. Well, you know, it was really interesting that, okay, so so the cool thing about, re- so first of all, this year because of COVID, uh, you know, Mongo- oh. Mongolia took probably one of the strictest quarantines of any country because uh, it was very reasonable what the government said. They basically said, look, you know, we're a developing country. There were only very few ventilators in the whole country. There's only a few you know, Western trained doctors or whatever, like, you know, better hospitals and things like that. And that's pretty much only in the capital. And they didn't, did an assessment and they, and um, last year they had a flu outbreak and the number Mm -hmm. of pediatric cases of flu was like triple the number of beds that were available. Oh God. And they, and they closed schools. And so this year it started again, we had another flu outbreak in January. So they closed schools for that. And then the COVID thing happened. The government basically was like, look, if this thing gets in here, it's going to ravage us, right? So they closed the border, very strict rules. So anyway, so we couldn't train wrestling. All the tra- training halls were closed from January through uh, around April. And I think, and I don't want to name any names, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but I suspect that when I started training, I don't know that it was even legal. <laughs> like, like, because they would lock the door after we came in, and I thought that was really kind of strange, and the lights were up. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> but even that didn't happen until April. I, I, I think what happened in April, maybe... It wasn't officially sanctioned, but it got to a point that the police were kind of looking the other way at that point because it was, you know, toward the end of the lockdown. But we only oh, started wow. training in April, so there was no training. And the other thing is in February is Mongolian New Year, Sagansa, and they would have had big wrestling tournaments at Sagansa. And you can only get a ranking at Nadam. In fact, you can only get a national ranking at national rank, not, um, but you can only get a ranking at not, um, so Sagan, sorry, you don't even get a ranking, but how you perform in not, um, is you, I'm sorry, how you perform at Sagan, sorry, is usually predictive of what's going to happen in not, um, like they usually, you know, if you win Sagan, sorry, tournament, you have a good shot at, at not, um, and this year there was no Sagan, sorry. So oh. that was canceled. Well, that you gave know, you an advantage because they weren't. Yeah, right, right. I, ended, I caught them when they were down. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody, nobody, everybody was Perfect back. time to strike. I, it, 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 you know, Asia, so Mongolia is unique. You know, Mongolia is really unique. But um, I take Asia in general compared to the States, like, like, or even Europe compared to the States. Americans are just so much about, like, just get it. Just do it. Just do, you know, when, when you have work to do, you just do it. When you have a problem, you just do it. And, like, I remember in, in China when I was wrestling, when we had the New Year holiday. And everybody went home for five weeks. So we come back after five weeks. And I said to my wrestling teammates, I go, first of all, they all walked in. They're all really fat, right? And I say to them, I go, yeah, um, the holiday was terrible. We couldn't wrestle. So I was lifting weights every day, right? Because like Americans, the first thing, oh, oh, I can't train. Either you're injured, you're sick, or the training's canceled. So, okay, well, I can go lift weights. And so I was lifting weights. And, and I was complaining that I hadn't wrestled in five weeks. And all the other guys were like, fat. I mean, they'd all gained like, you know, 10 kilograms. And I go, what the hell happened? They go, oh, no, I didn't move. I didn't move at all. <laughs> that was in Chinese, in Chinese. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't move at all. Like, they just went home and just ate and drank and you didn't move. And I, and I thought they were all going to come back with stories like, oh, there's a little gym in my town and that's the only place I could work out or, you know, I was jogging or whatever. Nothing. Just nothing. So... And this was, uh, was this Swai Jiao or that they were doing or in China? Yeah. Yeah. I was on the Swai Jiao team because 
they they're super racist in China. And is it racist to say that? Is it racist um, to say racist? I guess yeah. it depends on who you're calling racist. <laughs> uh, China. Oh, let's not go there. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but they were they were no like like they don't let so all these foreigners got scholarships to go to the sports university. Uh, because and a lot of them because they were outstanding athletes and then we, we got there and we weren't allowed to train on any of the teams <laughs> yeah that's pretty like, hard to not call that the that word <laughs> and, that, and, and, and it's also madness because like like my I had a roommate the first semester and he was a, um, a runner from Japan and he was ranked number sixth in Japan and I go why did you come to this university he goes well the coach here coached the first Chinese guy that won, I don't know if he won a gold medal or won a medal in the Olympics in, in this kind of specific event of running. He goes, and the other thing is that in Japan, there's a limited number of sports universities. And so he would have been at the same university training with the other five guys that he had to compete against. Oh, ah, so, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, they would have been, I guess, at the top sports university, whatever that is in Japan. And so he just thought, well, it'd be better I go somewhere else and train with other people. So he came there, full scholarship, because he's an exceptional runner, and gets there, shows up from track practice, and goes, no, you can't train, you're foreign. Oh, God. And he goes, what am I supposed to do? They're like, well, you know, it's only four years. At the end of four years, you can start training again. Jeez. So yep. it was a complete waste of time to go to, to that school. Yep, for, and all and all, all the foreigners or all the ones that were admitted for athletics, we all had stories like that. So I got there and show up for wrestling practice. You know, you can't wrestle. And um, so what finally happened was they had a B team. There's like the A team and the B. The A team is the Greco-Roman team. It's like the real official university team. And then there was this B team, which was this Chinese wrestling team that because of politics inside the university, it was housed inside of the Olympic sports sort of division of the university yeah um but uh you know it should have been housed inside of the wushu department but wushu mm -hmm. department didn't have enough authority or pull so ones that wind up getting housed inside of the like olympic sports modern sports division and all the guys that are on the team eff effectively almost all of them were guys that were admitted for greco-roman wrestling and then either got injured or lost their matches or whatever got kicked off the team or had to leave the team and they put them on this shui jiao team to keep them you know, so they stay in the university. And oh. Then they let, yeah. So they let me be on that team. And, wow. um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really, it's hard generally in Asia to train um, as a foreigner. I, I Not to train. Like, people are really, again, like, across Asia, like, everywhere I've trained, people are nice. Like, I've never been to a country where people are not nice. I've never been to a country where people don't automatically, like, you know, that, fawn over you in some way because you're a foreigner or give you advantages that they wouldn't give you know to someone i mean i've been a lot of times like, waiting in line and it's fair i'm waiting in line oh no you go to the front you know things like that which it makes oh. you feel also a bit awkward but it's nice right in general they're nice to you but yeah. but there are some weird things like in most countries in asia um when you talk about immigration for example one of the first requirements for citizenship is that you have to be that ethnicity Mm -hmm. they, they almost won't uh, they, you know most countries in asia not all but most will not issue you know a passport to someone who is not that, that's the first requirement you have to be that ethnicity so you know like china for example china has issued i think 2500 passports in the last 20 years <laughs> to naturalized citizens yeah you know yeah um so anyway, when you get in there and you're competing as an athlete, you get to the university and you suddenly find out you're not allowed to be on the team or you're not allowed to, or you're allowed to train. So like there was me, there was a girl named Kat, she was from Czech Republic and she was allowed to be on the Wushu team. But somehow when they went to competitions, she, she would even go with them, but she would have to register in the open division. The I don't think place? she is. No, no, open, like um, open to, to the public open to the public wow. they'd be like so there'd be a division for all the colleges that were competing against each other and then there'd be another one that's just for members of the community or whoever wants to compete in there and she would have to i i'm pretty certain that all it, it most if not all of her competitions were in this other sort of open division uh another guy was doing sanda i forgot what country he was from 
and that happened to him like two or three times. And then finally, he they went to Hong Kong for competition, and he went to register in the open division. They go, no, we have a rule that you have to be under a certain age. Huh. And that happens in Taiwan too. Like, like the, the, the actually in, Ch in China, theoretically, I was too old, but they let me compete. You know, once with the you know with, it went with the team, actually competed on the team, but uh, uh, they actually have have like an age limit, you know, in addition to an ethnicity, you know, requirement. So, so a lot of people joined, and then a lot of these foreigners fought tooth and nail to get the scholarships, pass the exams, get into the university, and then they got there, they found out they couldn't teach, uh, couldn't train, and then a lot of them left. Um, and uh, are they like actively recruiting foreigners to come yep. to their school and then they say then once they get there you can't compete yep. at least officially yep yep why, yeah, I, why, I stopped why in. all that effort in to get those yeah. people there unless it makes their and money better and money and money we were all we were all on full scholarship we all had free dorm monthly stipend you know pocket money every month and and as a phd student i also had a research budget um so we got all this money free tuition Hmm. but then you're, then you're not allowed to train. So, um, you know, and then, and then even if you train, you go to company. So like, so like my, my Japanese friend finally convinced the coach to let him train on the team, but not compete. And then finally they had this one competition and he went and he won the first three rounds. And there, there were four rounds. And at the end of the third round, they said, Oh, I'm sorry, you can't advance to the finals because you're Japanese. Yeah. I mean, say what you want about – how can you not say that that's discrimination? Madness. How can you not say that? I mean, I get it. I think as a whole, you know, like, oh, we are Han people and we want to be China. as a. But still, if you're a world power and you're not taking in the input from other people, it's horrible. That's – Yep. Yeah. And um, like here, I have a Mongolian friend that he was a three time NCAA division one all American. And I love that. I love that. America is like the only country that will let you be an all American when you're not American. You know? <laughs> and I think that's really great about our country. You know, you went to, you had a full scholarship for wrestling and, you know, he won legitimately won. And so it doesn't matter that he's Mongolian and not American. What, why should that matter? Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard other things too. Like, for instance, the in the west of China, there are these ethnically Uzbek or Muslim that are Uyghur. actually way way better at soccer than the Han Chinese. They're like they're like run circles around them, but they don't make the team. Oh, th that's across Asia. Uh, Malaysia has the same situation. Most of their really good athletes are Chinese, you know, Chinese Malaysians, but the national soccer squad has to be Malay because they want to present a Malay ethnicity to the world oh okay so that's yeah. not just china yeah no that's that's across asia that that happens all the time and um last year i was at a wrestling competition here and two funny things happened so one was one of the heavyweight wrestlers comes up to me and starts talking to me in perfect english i'm like what the hell and he goes oh i wrestle at i got the name of the college a lot of them are at like these no name no name colleges in the states because obviously your admission is some metric of your wrestling ability and yeah. Academics. Yeah. 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 He's wrestling in the States and he was here for the summer and, and competing. And so he was really cool. And then the Chinese team shows up and they immediately, you know, we're talking, you know, in Chinese. And then it turned out that they're the leader of the Chinese team was inner Mongolian. So I guess that's why they sent him, you know, cause he could translate for the team. And then all the athletes on the team were all ethnic minorities, which I thought was really interesting. Uh huh. Huh. Yeah. They, yeah. Like from from Xinjiang and from Inner Mongolia. But in Inner Mongolia, there's so Xinjiang is the Uyghur people, but there's also a uh, significant Kazakh and Mongolian Uyghur. population. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. So here, so what happens? So I go to this competition. So it's like so so uh, yeah. So uh, so coronavirus, not um. At first, everyone was worried it was going to be canceled. And, every, and like the whole country was sad. They're like, uh, Sagan Star got canceled. And you know, Asian people, you know, it's a bit of, I don't want to call it superstition, but it's kind of a belief that you have to have a good new year, you know, in the new year. What happens at New Year celebration sort of 
determines what's going to happen for the year. You want to have a good New Year's celebration, and then you know that your year's going to be good. And their New Year's celebration got canceled, so they're all sad about that. And then uh, the competitions got canceled, training got canceled. And then in June, they apparently allowed the wrestlers to go out to the steps and train in the training camps as usual. I don't know if they allowed it or if it just happened, but it did happen. So I went out to the training camp for a couple, uh, just like a couple of times. And then the, they said that not on would be virtual in the Capitol. So they would not allow a crowd to see it, but the athletes would, would be allowed to compete. Oh, okay. What does that mean though? Virtual, like VR headsets or? Just- no, 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 no. I mean, I mean the, 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 the games would go on as usual, just they wouldn't have a live audience. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. They weren't going to allow people to come, come watch. Um, which is also sad because it's not just about watching that. Um, I, I, I get the impression there's sort of a whole kind of a festival atmosphere of the people going there. And also a lot of people um, buy very beautiful traditional clothes for specifically to go to not um, And it's kind of uh-huh. like one of the guys I interviewed said, it's like a vaccination against globalization. It's like mm-hmm. once a year we, we dress up and remember who we are and kind of thing. And so they were sad about that. But so in the capital, the games went on, but you couldn't attend them. But I got invited to go out to the province. And um, so I was able to, uh, so, I, so in the provinces, they had all the, uh, the, the crowd was allowed to be there. And, I, and, and then I was a guest of, I guess, some very important people, apparently. <laughs> so they were able to get me registered to wrestle as well. And then the Hi. funny thing about the, the wrestling was that I knew that there had to be something not exactly official about my registration because there has to be, to be fair, because um, everything in Mongolia is based on sort of, uh, what do you call it, num- numerancy, like that there's certain numbers that are that are lucky numbers and important numbers, and you have to do things in certain numbers. Like there's always 512 wrestlers in Nadam in the capital. Oh. Ex- except in special years when there's 1,024. Like there, there's certain numbers. And like in the Soms, the uh, – like I was in a psalm, which is a subdivision of a province. Provinces are divided into psalms. I was in a psalm that had 2,500 population, but there has to be six rounds of wrestling. Like there has to be. They have to make the numbers work out that there's six rounds of wrestling and you have to win six rounds to be crowned the champion. And there's specific animals that they assign you if you win five rounds you're a lion and if you win four rounds you're you're a garuda i believe you know what whatever the uh this hierarchy of the animals and it's how many wins you have so it has to work out that way and so i thought if they put me in there with someone who's not good and somehow i i, I knock that guy out of the competition that's not fair to him and i'm definitely going to lose in the next round anyway and if they put me in there with somebody who's good it's a little bit not fair too, because he's just going to walk over me and that's not fair to the other people he's competing against. So what was really funny was when they called my name, they called me and all the other wrestlers and it was at the second round. It was also weird. They put me in the second round instead of the first round. So I walk out with all the other wrestlers, they pair up, they start wrestling and I'm standing there all alone. Uh-huh. So the first guy to win his round, <laughs> the judge turns to him and goes, wrestle that white guy. <laughs> The light guy? He goes, you know, he goes like, like the first guy that won his round, uh-huh. the judge says to him, wrestle, oh, wrestle that, that white guy. Yeah, wrestle that foreigner, you know, Somebody. whatever he said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get a because he'd already won, like he'd already won, right? So he's, he's definitely going to advance to the next round. So uh-huh. it wasn't going to alter the outcome of, the, of Nadam, you know. And so, and, and there was no way I was going to beat him. And it turned out that he was last year's champion. So, Oh, so really? I, so yeah. you got to wrestle the champion? Yeah, I got to wrestle the champion. Okay, um, so uh, can you see the, uh, the the screen share? Yeah, so this is me. So this is really funny. So the, the, this guy in the picture here, he's one of my friends from Ulaanbaatar, and we didn't know. I didn't know he lived there. He didn't know I was going to be there. We bump into each other, and he goes, I know you're from the MMA gym in, 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 in Ulaanbaatar. And I just knew him from the MMA gym. We'd only met a few times, but anyway, now we're like best friends because we met at Nada. So what I didn't know is he's a master of sport in boxing. Okay. 
they have the Soviet system here where, you know, you're the master of sport and it's like an official title. So he's a master of sport in boxing and he doesn't know how to wrestle. That's what I knew from the MMA gym is that he doesn't really know how to wrestle, but huh. apparently he does national wrestling. He, he said it's his hobby, but he made it to about the third round. I think he actually got a ranking, got an animal ranking. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's just, everything about the experience. I mean, everything about Mongolia is really interesting to me. Everything about the culture and then getting to wrestle. The fact that I got to walk around like that, be with these guys, you know, from the inside rather than just outside was, mm -hmm. was just such an experience, you know? So these pictures here are a, a national training camp that I went to. I was there last year. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to close my window. Part of the um, coronavirus prevention thing is that these announcements go off about once every hour, reminding us to wash our hands and wear masks. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so these pictures here, this is what they call a national wrestling camp. So in June, these things usually open up. Um, they're frequently, if not always, they're sponsored by the local government. So this would be the local one for that province. And um, the guys go live in a gear, you know, live in a traditional, in a yurt, and they train for a month, uh, traditional wrestling every day to prepare for NADAM. So it happens in June and then NADAM's in July. And I only got myself organized, got my gear and everything like toward the end of June. So actually, this is already July 8th or something. This is almost the last day of the national wrestling camp that I made it here. So part of my decision was that I'm, I'm going to stay another year. And I think next summer, next June, I'm actually going to go live in a wrestling camp for a month. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that might be my last big, you know, cause I lived in the Shaolin temple. I lived in the, the Muay Thai temple in Thailand. Man, you know, I used to do these things when I was younger and I haven't done anything really unusual like that in a long time. So, so you're going to be like, out there, huh? In the stick. Yeah. Wow. Well, this one's just outside of one. But this is the crazy thing. I mean, you know, because the, the country is so sparsely populated that this picture is taken. You know, it's probably a 20, 30 minute drive outside of one by car. So it's okay. not that far. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I could theoretically commute, you know. I wonder because you look at the picture and you're like, damn, he's in the sticks. Yeah. But it's, not, it's, it's just like a little roll out of town and then yep. it's nature, huh? Well, the fact yeah. that you could see a telephone or power line or whatever that is. Well, like yeah, that. I guess there's, if you see power yeah. lines, you know, you're, you're probably not that bad. You're not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, like, probably could come if it needed yeah. to come. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I, I, can, I can theoretically commute to this one um, if I wanted to. So, I don't know. I'll work it out in June. I'll figure out what I'm going to do. Or maybe I'll live there for a week just for the experience. But Because it is hard living there because they have, um, you know, latrine, you know, open latrine, you know, uh, toilets and, and there's no showers but um this guy that's in this picture with me so um his name is Naiman and he's he's from inner Mongolia okay. and he he's a professional Shuaijiao wrestler in China and I wish I can get more interviews with him and I hopefully will and also, there's a guy named Han Gai, who's American, that lives in Inner Mongolia. And he's probably the foreigner that's ever been the most engagier, like the most, um, what's the word in English, like the most involved, the most deeply involved person probably ever in, in uh, traditional wrestling in China. And he lives in Inner Mongolia. And so between him and Naiman, I think I could probably get a lot of information that is very difficult to come by. But Naiman came here in January to train. And, you know, we're able to talk to each other, you know, in Chinese and he can translate for me and all that. So he came here to train in January and then because of coronavirus lockdown, he got stuck here. And in China, he's a professional Shuaijiao wrestler and he hates Shuaijiao. He's like absolutely hates it. He's like, I'm Mongolian. I want to do Mongolian wrestling. Oh, wow. So yeah. this in Mongolia, is, is, this, is this accurate? Is it actually China? Yeah. Inner Mongolia is a, it's called the Inner Mongolian uh, Autonomous uh, Province or Prefecture. I think they call it the Autonomous Province, but it's, um, yeah, it's Inner Mongolia. There are more Mongolians living in Inner Mongolia than there are here in Mongolia. There's like over 4 million, okay. maybe 4.5 million Mongolians living in Inner Mongolia. They are Chinese citizens. Um, they don't necessarily want to be, there is a, 
an independence movement. There used to be a lot of terrorism. Um, and what I say used to, like 10 years ago, and there may still be, but we don't know because it's not being reported. There are all sorts of organizations outside of China, like, um, a, you know, a Mongolian, you know, government in exile and independent Mongolian organizations and things like that, you know, very much like Free Tibet, this Free Mongolian movement outside of China. Um, and they, one of the things China did, they, they claimed to have religious and ethnic freedom. So they encouraged the Mongolians in Inner Mongolia to keep using the Mongolian alphabet. In oh, fact, encouraged. I saw, a, I think I saw a post on that. Yeah, yeah. About this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when we say encouraged, I mean, you could also say forced because what it did was it prevented them from using computers and it prevented them from using text messaging. And oh my God. So it's like, it's kind of underhand. So like use yep. your language that kind of disadvantages you. Well, yes. We encourage you to. China. Every yeah. time you think they're up to something, they're up to something. <laughs> yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, because, because here in outer Mongolia, here, okay. So outer Mongolia is independent Mongolia where I live, right? The Republic of Mongolia. So Mongolia uses the Cyrillic alphabet. So China paints that as, oh, those Mongolians in Mongolia are not free to exercise their culture because they have to use the Russian alphabet. But because we use the Russian alphabet here, first of all, everybody can learn it. Everybody can read. I mean, because literacy, when, when they used the Mongolian alphabet, literacy was like 3% of the population. And oh, today, really? literacy, Yeah. And today, literacy in Mongolia approaches, you know, Western stand, international standards. I mean, it's really close. It's within a few percentage points of what you would expect for a developed country because we use Cyrillic and um, forcing inner Mongolia to use Mongolian alphabet also meant they couldn't read anything that was being produced here. Okay. So that kept sort of freedom movements and things, you know, at a disadvantage. So, um, so a lot of the Mongolian culture is suppressed in China, although they, they claim, and for tourism, they claim that they're promoting it, but actually they're suppressing a lot of it. And so I don't know to what extent the Mongolian wrestling, you know, is allowed to, I mean, I know that it's happening and, and I see Han guys constantly training and wrestling out on the steps and things like that in inner Mongolia, but I don't know to what extent they have the official, official not, um, I mean, I mean, I know that they have it, but, but, but I don't know exactly how it works. And so like, like why is Naiman, why is he a Shuaizha wrestler and not a Mongolian wrestler? Or is it because financially there's no support from the government if you do Mongolian wrestling or there's no professional sort of, um, element to that, you know, and, 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 you know, is that a sport at the, at any of the sports universities or, or not, you know, is, is it suppressed? So anyway, so he winds up on the Chinese Shuaizha team, which he, hates and that's what he and that's his full-time job that's his full-time but you can have a full-time job in Swaijiao, huh i mean sort of you have to remember that the average income in china is ten thousand dollars a year oh. so they're not earning a lot of money and then if you look at inner mongolia the average income is probably something like uh five hundred dollars a month and so as a professional you know athlete what they call they just call it juanye dwe and juanye has the meaning of professional but it also has the meaning of being your major like in a uh -huh. university that's your major so when he says to me well sure join the try out so like it, it yeah it sort of means he's a professional athlete but it probably means that he gets like uh 2000 rmb a month from the or even less maybe 1500 rmb a month from the government which is like less than 300 dollars a month from the government to train and compete and try out Mm -hmm. That would be the extent of what he did. It's not a professional athlete in the sense of like being a professional boxer in the States or something like that. So that's interesting. So, so Soviets made Mongolia learn acrylic. With, yes. But before, when they had their, I think this is an example of their native language, right? Their native Yes, language. right, right. So before the literacy rate, you say it was much lower? Yeah, okay, if you look if at I'm this post that you've got up here right now. Mongolian reading and writing was much lower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you look at this post that you've got up here right now, this is by a friend of mine, um, Sonom Sengi. And so he posts, if you look on the right, he's written in Mongolian language, but it's in, in Cyrillic. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's how we write here. 
And because of that, they're able to write on computers, they're able to text message, and literacy is very high because it's just an alphabet. You, you just yeah. learn it. You know, it takes you a week, a month, whatever it takes you to learn an alphabet. If you look at the one on the left, that's Mongolian traditional script. It's written vertically. The letters are very hard to draw. When that was the official script of Mongolia, literacy rates were probably less than 3%. Okay. So in the 20s, the Mongolian government already decided that they wanted to improve literacy, and they actually decided that they were going to start using the Latin alphabet, our alphabet, okay. uh, to write Mongolian. Just make sure you and don't they, use those Arabic numerals. Right, and the Arabic numerals. Uh, but they were going to push the Latin alphabet, and that lasted for just a very short, like a year or two. And then it was the same time when the Soviets were beginning to get involved with Mongolia. It's a really interesting point about Mongolia is that the, there was a revolution against the Chinese that was led by Russians, but they were, um, or, or assisted by Russians, but they were white Russians that supported the czar. Okay. Uh, so th there's a guy, th th Baron von Ungarn, who's like one of my favorite historical characters. And he was this white Russian that came here and he helped drive out the Chinese and installed the Bolt Khan as the, as the theoretical, the uh, we call it theological king, king of Mongolia. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, that was come by just, white Russians. Just in case somebody doesn't know, with white Russians, are we talking like more like oriented with the czar and yes. not with communism? Not necessarily, exactly. ca not Caucasian. No, 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 no. In fact, a lot of them weren't Caucasian. But okay. yeah, white Russian just means they supported the czar um, as opposed to the Bolsheviks, as opposed to the, you know, the communists. Okay. So, so, the, so, so there was that revolution. And then within very short period of time, there was a second, you know, revolution that was done by, by the communists, you know, or, or aided by communist Russia. And when that happened, then they began cutting ties with the West. And so they adopted the Cyrillic alphabet instead of the Latin alphabet. Are you familiar with Cyrillic? Mm-hmm. Well, you probably yeah, have to Cyrillic. to get around, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And I went to school for Mongolian until COVID started. So I, I don't speak it. You know, I mean, I know some, some, but I can read Cyrillic, so that helps a lot. And then there's so many loan words uh, from Russian, from English. And then there's a lot of loan words in Russian that came through Germany. And I don't know if it's because East Germany was communist and somehow that happened. But so there's a lot of times when I'm buying products in the store and like I read the label and, and yeah, I'm drawing either from, from German or, or, um, or English, you know, and I can, or Russian, and I, and I can read what it says on the, on the, you know, products. Wow. But this, yeah, this is a really, was a really fascinating idea to me. And then the fact that you said it's a little bit more complicated than that, it's like the culture of Mongolian language, I'm sure it's something they're all very proud of, but if it holds you back from being in the global world, because let, let's be honest, the world isn't going to be like, hey, have you tried this new Mongolian script? It is totally the bee's knees. We need to get rid yeah. of everything else. You know, it's like, yeah, like yeah. there's the culture and the repetition and the probably the peacefulness behind of knowing that you're connected with that culture. But kids can only learn so much, you know. Yeah. You know, they already got math, science, language yeah. of their own language. And then now you got to learn three alphabets. Yep. I mean, something's got to give. Um, yep. So it's almost like that own native language might hold them back a little bit as a country. And that's, that's kind of sad, but I don't know. Yeah. It's really thought provoking. It's, it's, it's a reality across Asia because um, like, like in, in Cambodia, you know, I worked in Cambodia for years and, and when text messaging first started, um, Obviously, there were no Khmer keyboards. In fact, computers didn't even have Khmer keyboards at that time. And there was certainly no software that was written in. Like, you have to know, first of all, I don't care what language you speak, even the most global language that exists. At some point, when you're using a computer or software or websites, you have to know English. Like, even major languages, like, like you can buy, you know, Microsoft Office, and it's all in German, or it's all in Chinese, and everything, or J Japanese. There's always going to be some function, some message, some something where you have to know English. Mm -hmm. um, it's true on the internet. It's true everywhere, you know. And so English becomes really important. And then when you're when you speak a minor language, when your language is not a global language, well, they, you know, like they didn't have software in Khmer. There was no Khmer software. There was no Khmer text messaging function. So I'm the sorry, kids. What, what is a Khmer? 
Khmer, Cambodian. Oh, okay. Cambodian language. Cambodian. Yeah, okay. so when I was working in Cambodia, so they didn't have any of this. So what happened was, and um, so they had to go out and learn the English alphabet or the Latin alphabet and then try and find a way to transliterate their Khmer language into Latin alphabet. And that's how they would text message each other. And that's how they would post on Facebook and things like that. And over the years, okay, now, now they actually do have software and they do have, you can type Khmer on a keyboard, but it's just so cumbersome that if you go on Facebook and you go in Cambodian groups or Cambodian, you'll see that a lot of them are texting in English or not, not in, in Latin script. You know, they're writing Khmer, but in Latin script. Mm. Just because here, here in Mongolia, like one of the weird ones here, my, my phone company sends me messages all the time. They're written in Mongolian, but they use Latin script. Because even here, there's people who don't have the all the scripts on their computers and on their phones and things. Oh, so so even some people don't have acrylic or at least the, the type. Well, it's a pain in the butt. I'm in Japan and Japan has like three alphabets or four alphabets. They use they use the Roman letters. They use Chinese letters. They use their own alphabet. And then they have this other alphabet that's like hiragana, but it's just yeah. foreign words. And yep. uh, I really admire Japanese people because they just seem to switch back and forth for it like this. But especially like when I'm doing editing and I have, if I use a Japanese keyboard, there are very specific commands, you know, control yes. C does this, control A does this. I don't want to hear it control A or control K or control B. You know, I want to hit control freaking C, you know? <laughs> so yeah, uh, I, I, got, I, really, I really sympathize for that. Um, and it's almost like, oh, screw it. We're just going to use, uh, you know, Latin letters. We'll type this, our words in Latin. I, <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, you're in a major country that produces, you know, you're in Japan, they make cell phones, they make computers, so they can go ahead and make them, uh, you know, custom customized for Japanese for the various alphabets and things like that. But can you imagine a country like Mongolia that doesn't really produce much? So when you have a cell phone, like when you go into market here, there's Russian products, there's Chinese products, there's, there's German, there's like, you know, from all over the world. Um, you know, I, you know, I always joke about, I, I, they happened again yesterday. I saw Oreo cereal, American Oreo breakfast cereal written in Korean letters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what, that's what happens in the market here is that, you know, it's a mix of everything. So probably some people, they, they got a, a really cheap, and people don't have a lot of money. So you found a cheap cell phone from China used, or from, you know, some other country used cell phone that he bought in the market randomly, and it doesn't have Cyrillic on it. Hmm. But he bought it because it was a cheap phone. So how does he write? He writes the Latin alphabet, because every cell phone in the world has the, you know, the Latin alphabet on it. Oh, I see. He actually didn't get it from Mongolia. He got the cheap phone. So you just yep. say... You just use the Latin letters. I get it. Yeah. You know, and I don't even know. I, you know, of course, English is my native language. I don't know if you notice. I'm very fluent in English. Yeah, you're good, man. You, you make very few mistakes. I've been, well, <laughs> I've been practicing. So I wonder if I can really say whether Latin letters or that type is really the best or if it just has the luxury of being the world language. But I couldn't imagine there is benefits, and I'm sure you know too, from from Chinese. Sometimes the pictographic, like typology, sometimes like for road signs or whatever. Sometimes it, it does seem to convey a, a, a message faster. Um, like falling rocks, if you know those character, like you you look one character, two character, you know, and then instant death or something. You know, <laughs> it feels like that is kind of a luxury. But if you had to have a database that actually remembered these sounds and it could be this, this shot could be this shot, or this shot, man, I just, I can't even imagine as a native English speaker, how you could make a, a good, like technological workflow with so many freaking different yeah. technologies. So if you look at Vietnamese, like, like I studied Vietnamese when I lived in Vietnam and that would be a really good example. Vietnamese used to be written with the Chinese characters. And Vietnamese has tones. So like you said, this sha or that sha or the other sha, and they all have different meanings. Uh, Vietnamese has tones. And so when French 
speaking priests introduced the Latin alphabet in Vietnam, they had to invent an alphabet for Vietnam and they had to, how do you do the Tomar and whatever. And Vietnamese is like one of the hardest languages to learn to write and read because it really should have been written some other way other than with the Latin alphabet. Huh. Well, that's right. Yeah, because Vietnam, well, I'm sure a lot of Cambodia, like just they use just Latin speech, right? Maybe occasionally you might see some Chinese characters. What, in Cambodia? Well, Cambodia has its own alphabet. Oh, is that what's in the newspapers and everything yep. else? Too? Okay, so that, sorry, that's different. But Viet, when I was in Vietnam, I was like, yeah, I was kind of amazed. I was like, hey, everything's English. Wait, no, yeah. it's not English. It's I don't know English. the words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, there's all yeah, these well, lines on top of it. <laughs> but, yeah, they use the Latin alphabet. So, so that would be a really good example of what you were just saying, though, that that – for some ancient languages, it's very hard to convey the meaning with Latin letters because, yeah, like you said, sha, S-H-A, right, could have six different meanings of Vietnamese, right? And it's not obvious. But if you're writing characters, it's obvious because they're completely distinct characters. Mm. Um, Japan, so this is a really, really interesting point about Japanese and Chinese. So on my phone, I have, I just switch it over to Chinese whenever I want to. And, you know, I can type in Chinese the way we, the way we do it in China versus Taiwan, I've studied in both countries, but I did my PhD in China and the Chinese way is much better. And the Chinese way is that they use the Latin alphabet. So if I'm gonna type Sha, I type S-H-A and it gives me all the choices of Chinese characters. And I choose the one that's appropriate. So you still have to know the Chinese characters, but you type according to sound. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, one of the things about Japanese is that Japan can adopt foreign words because you can write them. Right. I heard that, but China is kind of against that. Right. I, I don't know if this is accurate, but I heard instead of using like Japan would say computer, computer, computer yes. in their own pronunciation. Whereas China and correct me if I'm wrong, has like literally say electronic brain or something. Electronic like that. brain. Yeah. Dna. Is that yep. what, oh, is that really what it is? Yeah. And yeah, but but, but there's a of this yeah. too. They but, are okay. So they are uh, okay. I don't want to use the R word again. They don't like things that are not Chinese. <laughs> they don't but, like things that are not Chinese. Okay, we'll say that. We'll we'll, yeah. we'll make our sentences progressively longer because of words we we won't want to say. <laughs> they dislike the global influence of no, but but the other issue is that with Chinese characters, there's no way to write foreign words. Hmm. I can't write computer in Chinese. How can I, how am I gonna write computer with a picture, right? With pictures that already exist, you know? You can't write foreign words. It is very difficult to write foreign words, so they just make up their own words for things. So computer is not, it's like the only country where computer is not computer or some mix of that. It's mm -hmm. as its own word. Well, I mean, in some way I admire that because in Japan there's this thing called wase ego, where it's like, I don't know how, so, so somewhere down the line, a Japanese person heard the English word and said, yeah, I think it means this, and everybody just ran with it. <laughs> and sometimes it's very minor differences, but sometimes it, it, it is, I can't think of any good exam, examples, but like, for instance, Merito, like, um, you know, I had to read this for my English lesson plan, and it was like, oh, these are the different Merito. And I was like, oh, so merit, so it's something that you earn or something you get, and it's like, no. This is just like something that's, I don't even remember what the real world was, but I, my, my boss was like, did you read this? And I was like, yeah, but I thought that was merit, right? Merit, merito. And it's like, no, this is, these are like the selling points. Oh, this is what you get, not what you earn. Benefits, benefits. Like, yeah, it was more like benefit. Yeah, yeah it was more yeah. like benefit than I merit. Like merit was something I thought, oh, you do this and you get this. But no, yeah, so, you know, it's similar, and it, yeah. it wasn't really a big miscommunication, but I was like, oh, at a certain point, somebody heard this word and said, oh, it means this, so let's reuse it again. And it just, it wasn't that big of a difference, but there's other examples where the difference just gets bigger and bigger. But yeah. where is like, nope, we're going to call it electronic brain, and that's yes. how we're going to refer to it. That's how we do it. Yeah. This is what we mean. I kind of yeah. respect that, but I know that's problematic as well. There's a lot of really funny, well, well, okay, so there's a whole area of linguistics, which is basically when a, a word has been borrowed from another language, but then it doesn't, it has a different meaning. 
Uh-huh. You know? And then there's another area, and I've got the names of all these things. One of them is called a calc. One of them is a loan word. One of them is whatever. There's different terms. But another one would be a word like salary man, right? Okay. Salary is an English word. Man is an English word. But we do not have the word salary man. <laughs> but Japan does, and it's a cool word, and it definitely describes, you know, what they want to say with it. It makes sense, but we don't have that in English, right? And they made it up out of, like, English words. Well, that that's probably an exception because actually salary man, it seems that maybe because I know what it is, it seems even though it's not an English word, it, it does put a very quick image. I feel like I know who this person is, what this person yeah. does if I hear salary man. And, of course, man is in it, so it's gender-specific. But uh, I'm sure we could have a salary woman. Uh, but that, that's harder to say, you know. Uh, so let's just say it's a Japanese word. So there's female, there's female salary, man, male salary. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yeah. yeah. So sometimes yeah. I guess it works and sometimes we drop the ball. But <laughs> Yeah, like, like in, um, in most of the world, a uh, cell phone is called a hand phone, you know. Okay. Much of the world, cell phone is called a hand phone, you know. Um, you know, again, it's 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 an English idea, and and then there's another. God, I, I wish I could remember all the linguistics. There's a term that, that when you translate directly from another. So, for example, handphone is then translated directly into Mongolian, right? So they would say like "gar utas," which means like, oh. which literally means hand phone. They're not using the English word, but it was translated directly from hand phone. Oh. Well, so one one language makes a certain interpretation, and then they wind up having to teach another country that, and then they just run with it, and the just the telephone lie gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah, the telephone lie. Yeah, well, because, okay. Because like, because like the Mongolian word for spinning, like if you drive past a gym and they have the sign of all the classes they offer, mm -hmm. spinning, kickboxing are all just written in Cyrillic, okay. and it's spinning and kickboxing and it's just written in Cyrillic like so they've taken the English word they've just written it in Cyrillic right whereas like gar utas is a translation of the word hand and the, the word phone mm. <laughs> well I totally didn't expect to go down the linguistical <laughs> alley but I'm glad we did <laughs> that's my other thing is my linguistics economics and wrestling that's my <laughs> I mean, you can't say they're not connected in some level. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, cool. So let's uh, wrap up with uh, more in the Dom. And, yeah. and then uh, uh, I want to show a little uh, some of your YouTube channel, if that's all right. Sure, sure. When's the last time you posted on YouTube? Or you haven't been... No, recently I haven't even done a video uh, about Mongolian uh, martial arts or Mongolian wrestling. Um, I, I kind of stopped. I, I did the martial arts odyssey, the video series. It started as a print series in Black Belt magazine in 2003. Mm -hmm. And it went as a print series and then it became an official column in 2009. It's called um, Destinations in Black Belt magazine. And then I did the, the video series started in 2007. And then I once I started fighting MMA, it became a lot less interesting because I wasn't doing so much out in the field research anymore. So I only posted spor sporadically. And I really, I think the last thing I posted was probably from India in 2018, maybe, I, uh, when I was training and uh, wrestling in India. That, that might actually be the last time. I, I posted from Bali and I posted from India. Those are kind of my two big adventures I did in 2018 and 2019. And I haven't even done one on Mongolia now. Wow. So this is like, because uh, I was always like trying to brainstorm ideas to do like for martial arts. And then I was like, yeah. And then I was like, wait, no, this guy's already done that. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah, really I think there's 250 episodes, I think, roughly 250 episodes of Martial Arts Odyssey, 10 minute episodes. Uh huh. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I just, and I, especially that you're like, it's probably not the biggest audience, you know, but like, I like that you cover like the, the not necessarily obscure, because I'm sure it's very special in the places that they are. Uh, but 
I just think that's really amazing. I just can't get enough of it. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah. I think, I think that I'm going to take a different turn now. I think that I am going to do, obviously I'm going to do some videos from Mongolia, but I think now what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to hire, you know, people to do it professionally rather than the, you know. Oh, too. Yeah. Oh, so you were doing all of the filming, the editing, everything. Yeah. This is this is this before they even invented the the selfie stick. I mean, this is I, I'm shooting, I'm starring, I'm 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 editing, you know. And then and then people want to call me. You know, people. You look at the comments. People are always complaining. They're like, "Oh, you know, your quality is really poor." <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like. I'm like a one man team. Yeah, I have to wrestle and make sure it's a good shot. I mean, like, get off my ass, YouTube. <laughs> but uh, it's amazing, though. But you were doing this like 10 years ago, you know, and uh, everybody's trying to like have something cool on YouTube. And uh, but you were doing it, you know, I just think it's really amazing. Oh. The, the funny thing about Martial Arts Odyssey was that people who criticized me you know, would say that they could do better, whatever. And what was really interesting, there has never, I think even until now, there are people that produced one video, which is dramatically better than anything I've done. Because now people are producing in their phone a better video than what I was able to do in 2007. You know, yes. with, yeah. Um, but I haven't seen anybody go 250 episodes and I haven't seen anybody go more than, I, I haven't been monitoring it so closely now, but let's say through like 2015 when I was still checking periodically, there was nobody who went two or three episodes. They would go do one great one about Thailand and like, oh, this is the first one and I'm going to do the world. And I'm going to do better. Okay. And then they maybe went two episodes, three episodes. Like, Right. Um, now somebody can make an amazing video of them just sitting in their living room. <laughs> yeah. That's not that interesting, but it has all the necessary stuff to hit the algorithm. You know, and uh, but it's yep. like this is just great content, and like the in real life we don't have things optimized for our uh, viewing pleasure. We have to find out more about it. We have to research. We have to search. We have to do it. We have to try. We have to fail. And uh, yeah. but if you see the trend, if you see the trend in social media, you know one of the most popular media now is Instagram, which Instagram effectively has very little information. It's just pictures. It's just visuals. Uh huh. You know, like journalists, for example, still use Twitter because they can write stuff. You know, Facebook, every time I think Facebook is dead, I find out there's another application of Facebook that's actually really important for, you know, political writing, for different kinds of journalism, for you know, okay. disseminating information. And, and I'm realizing that, that the world is moving to people want snappy, attractive video, video images, and they want less information. So like my video, someone will produce a better cushy wrestling video than what I have here. But then what, what's the information? And, and you know, there'll, there'll be very little or they don't have the interviews or they don't have, you know, because, okay, India, I don't speak Indian. It's one of the, one of the you know, I don't speak Hindi or, or any of the languages that they speak there. But, you know, in probably 70, 80 percent of the videos that I produce, I mean, I speak the local language and I'm interviewing the people and I and I use translators as well. Um, and here I'm interviewing, you know, the guy whose house I'm staying at, my coach, he's the number one wrestling journalist in India, you know. And people don't have that. And they don't seem to want that information. I don't know. They just want nice images to look at. Yeah. I don't know. It's really amazing. But so, okay. So if Instagram is going this way, I, especially with your uh, you know, experience in China, I was wondering, <laughs> should I make a talk? <laughs> is it worth it? <laughs> I mean, it's up to you. You know, you know, I think you have to decide what, what you want in life. So, so for me, I wanted to document these martial arts and get information that people don't have and make it available to them. Because most people, believe it or not, the average person has not wrestled in India. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Um, you know, so I wanted to get information and make it available to people. You know, say at heart, I'm basically a teacher. You know, I want people to, to understand these cultures. Most people can't go there. They can't do this. And that's what I wanted. So if that's what you want, you look at this video. It's from 2017. It has less than 500 views. <laughs> you know, and then there's a girl who takes pictures of her butt and she gets 85,000 million views a day, you know, and makes a living, you know, off of taking pictures of her butt. Well, I used to hate on that, but it's like, I started an Instagram, you know, and I thought, oh, I'm going to promote this whole martial arts thing. But you know what I do? I get on it 
and I look at hot girls working out and I forget what the hell I was even doing. I, I was, I mean, I'm not even joking. I mean, like I, I have to concentrate. Like I have to like, I'm sorry. I get a lot of enjoyment from this, but I just have to unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. But you know what? Instagram recommends so many more hot girls yep. working out. Yep. <laughs> oh, you didn't like that hot girl working out? What about this hot girl working out? And so I just had to draw the hard line. I'm just going to make a completely different thing. And I only do stuff for martial arts. And that's so small. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a small, it's, I think it's a growing community, but I think how you get into the right um, yeah, I, group. Yeah, I, I don't even know what people want anymore because you know, I get criticized for everything, you know, everything from the horrible quality of my videos to there's not enough information. And I'm like, I wrote a bloody dissertation. I, I don't know that there's yeah, a lot sit of down and read. Read something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for um for uh for Kushti for the Indian wrestling, there is a book called, I believe, The Wrestler's Body, and that is that guy's PhD dissertation. Okay. And it's not great reading. I mean, like, I really respect him. And he put years, of, and he grew up somehow. He's a Westerner that somehow grew up in India for some reason. And he actually wrestled Kushti a bit when he was young. And then he realized he wasn't a very good wrestler and he just stopped. And, but, but, but he wrote his dissertation on it. And um, there's a book out of Pakistan about, oh, it's called Blood and Sand, I believe. And it's about um, Kushti in Pakistan. Blood and, and sand. I have got to Google search that. I'm sorry. Keep going. Yeah. And <laughs> it, but it's really interesting. It's about Kushti. Well, they don't call it Kushti, of course. Pelowan, Pelowan wrestling in, in Pakistan. But it's just really interesting that, like, that's it. I don't know that there's any other books. And I really considered staying in India long enough to write a book on Kushti. And, but I wasn't sure that I could bring enough to that subject to make an interesting book. Whereas here in Mongolia, I, I really made money. So not I'm kind of changed my life and I've decided I'm extending an extra year. I'm going to stay one more year in, in Mongolia. I have so many friends now. I have so many connections now that I think I could do a book and do it justice. One of the things here, you know, we talked last time about that feeling of somebody's tunneling from the other side. There, you know, I live right next to a sports university. There are people doing their PhD on various Mongolian subjects, including wrestling. There are Mongolian wrestling books in Mongolian. And I think that maybe dedicate myself this year to not only learning and writing and doing interviews, but also helping the Mongolians to translate their books into English. And if that means my experience from China has been that books written in Chinese that you then translate into English are just unpublishable <laughs> I guess because there's so much that, that that may not be interesting or may not be but what we might be able to do here is at least translate it into English then use it as a source for a larger work I think that's probably I think that that's the most likely thing that, that that I would see happening here I don't know if you've ever read Tim Cartmel he translated the book the art of Ch no it's called the way of Chinese wrestling um, uh, no but I'll take a note yeah, there's a book called um, Tong Tong Yi, I believe, was was the original author, and he was a wrestling master. And he wrote this book called Chung Guo Jiao Fa or something something along those lines, which is basically just um, the art of Chinese wrestling. And Tim Cartmel was living in China studying Sanda, and he he translated Tong Zhong Yi's book into English, and it's all over Amazon. You can buy it. I used it as a source for my dissertation. And I've been in contact with Tim, and I said, Tim, I go, there's people like Tim, there's people like Han Gai. There are people out there that have a very interesting story. Because a lot of times people say to me, they're like, oh, you're living the dream. You're the only one I'm going to know. There, there, there's a lot of people doing really interesting things, but they didn't write books for some reason. And mm -hmm. Tim never wrote a book about his experience in China. And I, and I don't know why. And I've been in contact with him a few times. And he's a jiu-jitsu instructor now. He, like, became a black belt. And he is, like, a jiu-jitsu guy. And, and from what I understand, he's a very good coach. And, um, and uh, you know, I've, I've talked to him about it. I said, Tim, maybe what if I come stay with you and you train me for, like, my next MMA fight? And during that time, we'll do interviews and, and we'll write a book about your experience in China. But anyway, he had a really, the other one is Matthew Polly. Now, Matthew Polly published his book, though. The, uh, it's called An American at the Shaolin Temple, I believe. Okay. Or American Shaolin. 
Mm. Think. And the really interesting is that Matthew Polly's book was announced before mine was. And my Shaolin book is called The Monk from Brooklyn, and his is, I believe, called American Shaolin. And they advertised it as the first book written by an American who studied at Shaolin Temple. And then my publisher contacted them and said, no, Antonio's book is first. <laughs> and, uh, and they actually changed it. But you know what? People, oh, they actually changed it? I would have thought, no, nah, yeah, enough people did. already heard the ad. So, yeah, but still, yeah. God. But then Matthew, Polly, and I got to be friends because of that. And that was really nice. And actually, after I read his book, I went, wow, I'm like, Matthew, what you did in China is so much bigger than what I did when I wrote The Monk from Brooklyn. You know, mm. you know, what I did over the next seven years in China was uh, was very deep, you know, but 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 what I did the first time, the monk from Brooklyn is nothing compared to what he did. I mean, he lived inside the temple and he fought signed out competitions. And um, yeah, he, he he did a lot, you know, very proud of him. But uh, but anyway, there's people out there with these stories. And you know, Matthew published his book, became a bestseller. Um, Tim has never written a book. I don't know why. Um, there's, it's um, hard. Writing a book's hard. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah, but pair up with with an author who knows how to do that, or pair up with a journalist who knows how to interview you. You know, and get it out mm. be, be, because because this information's gonna gonna die, or it's gonna be lost, or it's never gonna be shared. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. You know? So there is ways, even if you're not the most literate person. Yep. You know that uh, if you have really great things to say, there's people that do. That's all they yep. do. Huh, I never thought about that. And I guess if you don't take that time to invest in yourself, then it'll just go away. Yep. Huh. Yep. And when I talk to people like you, when we're doing podcasts and things, I realize there's a lot of things I didn't write down as much as I kept a diary. Um, there's a lot of things I didn't write and then we talk about it. And I actually considered a pairing up with a journalist to write my book about the sports universe because I never wrote it. I never wrote a book about being an American training in the sports university in China. And obviously it's, no one's ever written a book like that. You know, there's very few Americans. Um, the, uh, Robert, this guy named Robert, who was a year ahead of me, but he was a master's degree student. So he graduated the year before I did, but with a master's. So I was the first American to get the PhD and I would assume the only one. And I don't know that any Americans have been admitted since we graduated. So there's very few out there that have done that and and um so that book would you know i, I think that that book needs to be written and let people mm. know what, the, what it's really like inside of a sports university in china wow um and, yeah that's wow man. That's I'm just sorry, like, <laughs> linguistics china mongolia <laughs> well you know i I think that's the good thing about a podcast is you have to spend time with people you know so yeah. i could i could just clip like one three second horrible thing that you might have said and not even let you finish <laughs> <laughs> you know but i think the whole thing in podcasts we sit through it and then we kind of uh, find out a bigger picture of something so on that yeah. note, I, I really appreciate it i wish i wish uh, we could talk more uh but uh yeah let's call it a wrap for today yeah yeah <laughs> we're all over the place well listen guys yeah i really appreciate it colt i appreciate your support i appreciate how much you love uh wrestling and judo and you're promoting martial arts i really really uh i love what you're doing and thank you for having me on i'd love to come back again sometime and we'll talk about anything you want to talk about <laughs> same here same here or you or uh, maybe i can consult you on my crazy theories and you could either confirm or deny <laughs> We can do that. And we get readers right in about their crazy theories and we can address a uh, crazy theory episode. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a blessing. Thank you. And uh, let's talk again soon. I'm glad you make it, made it back safe from the Dom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Have a good day. Yeah, you too.